Welcome to the Tribe of Testimonies. Here you will find conversations with faithful Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sharing their stories and their love of the Savior. My name's Andrea Hales. I'm Navajo, and I'm glad that you've decided to come and join us today. My guest today is Sister Pat Ironcloud. Um, she is amazing. I love her. Um, we we originally scheduled, and then my life got busy, and so we had to reschedule. So I was so grateful for her that she would make time to be with me. And it was kind of in the evening, uh, later than normal for her, and so I'm glad that she could do that. Um, and then she got to meet my husband after he came back from city council, and so that was fun to to have that a uh, few minutes together and uh, see, get, let my husband meet her and her, and Pat meet my husband. So that was fun. But I, I am just so moved by this woman and I'm so grateful for her. And I hope that you can feel that here as well. So here's Pat. I'm on the phone tonight with Sister Pat Ironcloud. Um, We've just had some good smiles and reminiscences of the things we are able to do and the people we've had. But, um, Pat, would you please introduce yourself in your tribal way as much as possible? If it's in your language, great. If it's not, that's fine. Not everybody speaks their language, and some languages are dead. Um, I'm a member of the Cinnabon Sioux Nation of Northeast Montana. Mitraje um, Ampetewashtewi. My native name is Good Day Woman or Day of the Good Woman. And I've had that name since I was 18 years old, given to me by my great grandmother, because her mother was Good Day Woman. And so they gave that to me when they made me a princess at 18 years old. So you're speaking with a princess. <laughs> I am so grateful for that. <laughs> it was it was a wonderful time. I was only 18 years old and my great grandmother was born in 1885 and she was still on the earth. Um and she lived to be 1 month shy of being 100 years old. She never got on a plane. She always had the LDS missionaries at her house. That's how I was introduced to the church. So I was about 11 or 12 years old, and I walked over to her home, and and she she eats soup every day. Sometimes it's porcupine soup. Sometimes it's uh, soup from a pheasant or a duck or a deer. You know, just some of those are all, every day is different. And she'd bake bread, and then she'd go in the back bedroom and she'd quilt. So she was in the back bedroom, and I was sitting in the living room eating the soup. And here these two people come to the front door, and they're two little white boys. And I looked at them, and I says, what do you want? I said that. And they, and they opened their eyes like that. They said, oh, we want to talk to Sister Brushhorn. I said, Sister who? I said like that. And she said, he said, Sister Brushhorn. And so I could she heard them speaking and she said, Those are my grandsons. You bring them in here right now. So I opened the door, they came through and they went into her bedroom and sat on the other bed because there's two beds in her bedroom. And they were just talking to her and they were they were visiting her and she was making a quilt. And so one of the things that I heard them say, and I was really listening, and I was in the living room, but I was listening. They talked about the Book of Mormon. And when they said that, it was as if, it was as if I heard it before, you know. It was as if I needed that at that very moment because I had already questioned the church that I was going to how come our native people, how come we don't have a book of our own, you know, where Jesus was with us? And how come he didn't come visit us? 
you know, how come he just stayed over there and visited those people across the ocean? How come he didn't come over here? Because we wouldn't have killed him if he came over here. And and I was saying all these things to the minister that I went to go into church at. He couldn't answer my question. But as soon as I heard the missionaries telling my grandmother about the Book of Mormon, and they were telling them this man came across the ocean and and his children started writing into this book and it was just, it was like heaven sent to me it was heaven sent so they stayed there about a good hour and i kept on staying because i was interested by this time and so they get up and they leave and they introduce themselves to me and at 11 years old i was still a little boy i wanted to fight everybody still <laughs> you know and so they walk they walk out and as they walk out i follow them because i feel such a strength around them. It was a beautiful aura around them. And whatever they were selling, I wanted to buy it. Whatever it was, it didn't even matter. But I didn't know it was a power of the Holy Ghost. I didn't know. I just knew that I wanted it. And so I followed them out. Then they went and they left. Everywhere they were in the city of Popper, Montana, I followed them. Wherever they were. I love that feeling that I felt around them and things. And then I would leave them and then that feeling would go away, you know. And, but so two, three years later, missionaries came. And my missionary came from Maryland. And um, his name is Elder uh, Randy DeMars. And um, he lives in Washington right now. But he still he still found me after all these years and um, kept track of me and found out where I lived and everything. But he introduced the church to me and he asked if I would willing to join the church. And I said, yes. So I came home and told my grandma. She was supportive of me. My great grandmother was supportive of me. My mother wasn't. My mother, who didn't raise me, said, uh, if you if you join the church, she says, you're not my daughter no more. So I walked out, and as long as I had my grandma, because grandma raised me, and she, she was my real mother, you know, my grandmother. And so here, um, the day that I was baptized, my brother was also baptized with me. And then a month later, my grandmother and two of my siblings were baptized with her. So we were the first members of the LDS church in our family here. And I've been a member since, since 1966. I'm old as the hills. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> and things. So that's one of the big things. But we're members of the Assiniboine and Sioux tribes. The government put us on this reservation to kill each other. They would put warring tribes against each other so that we could do what do with do away with each other. Instead, um, we fell in love with each other. So I'm half a Cinnaboy and half Sioux because my mother and father um, were one of each tribe. My mother was Sioux and my dad was a Cinnaboy, and uh, so I'm half and half, and they just fell in love with each other. So half of our people are part of the born and part Sioux. So we live in northeast Montana. There's about 5 million acre reservation, one of the largest reservations. What is something that you love about your heritage as it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ? It can be pretty much anything. A story, a celebration, a way of life. What do you love about your heritage as it relates to the gospel? So one of the things I wanted to share with you, we moved down to Sisseton, South Dakota. And um, they don't have a branch there right now. They're trying to open it back up. But in Sisseton, they had a missionary comes in there. Him and his wife were elder missionaries, and they came in from Utah. And here he was writing a book about all his experiences with the native people. 
And so we were sitting there one day and and he says, did you have any experiences? So I shared with him, I said, my children have, I have, a lot of things have happened in our life, I said, and things. So we were sitting there and he says, why do you think we have reservations? I says, well, the only thing I could figure, I says, is they put us on this reservation because it became a jail to us. They couldn't round us up from every part of the world, but they put us on in this 5 million acre piece of land. And they said, if you leave it, we're going to punish you when you come back. And so a lot of our men were killed if they left their reservation boundaries and came back and they would shoot them. So I said, that's just like, that's what it is to me. I said, it's my home now, but it was a prison at that time in the 1889. I said, when it was established, I said. And he said, well, it's a little more than that. I said, well, can you share with me what you mean by that? And he says, what it is, he says, it's a gathering of Israel. He said, like right now, he says, where did you used to live? I said, I used to live in Chicago. I used to live in L.A. He said, I used to live in Oakland, California. I used to live in Minnesota. He said, so the places you live was a reservation? I said, only reservation was in Minnesota. Small little reservation. He said, was there a lot of Indians there? That was Indians galore. I said, all Ojibwe Indians, all Chippewa Indians, I said. He said, so on your reservation, there's a lot of Indians? I said, yeah, there's about, out of the 14,000 members we have, I said, there's about seven, 8,000 members living on this reservation. And he told her, he said, he said, well, that's why there's reservations. He says, God put that in our forefathers' minds to put the Indians on reservations so that he could keep track of the gathering of Israel so that the, you guys will be leaders of these last days, he said. These last days are here now, he said, so you will see them as leaders. And he said, um, you will be put in leadership position, not only in the church, he says, but you will be put in there in, um, like in the, the systems, like in the city councils, and like right up with me with the tribal council, and things like that, the state, you know, I work with the state as well. I sit on the um, Board of Pardons and Parole. I don't right now, but I, I do sit on this called Missing Murdered Indigenous Women Task Force. I sit that currently on there and stuff. So so those are the things that that he said. That's why they put these reservations there. And it was inspired. He said it didn't seem like it at the end. But he says, if you want to find out the house of Israel, he said, the missionaries are sent to you to bring you the gospel, he said. So it was really something, and I could see it. And I remember when President um, Spencer Kimball, is it Spencer W. Kimball? When he was a president, he told us, do not marry out of your race. And by that time, I was at Brigham Young University, and I fell in love with all non-natives, <laughs> you know, and blonde hairs and blue eyes, you know. <clears throat> and they fell in love with me, and they wanted to marry me. And I wanted to marry them. Then president came out with that declaration. So I said, I want to follow the, the president of our church. And he says, not to marry outside your race. And, and he said that. And, and I can still play that over and over in my mind. But. So I didn't just because of that, you know. So I think about that sometimes. And um, but anyhow, he wanted to keep the the race strong. That's what he said, and keep that blood strong. And then now we have the House of Israel that we're a member of, and the church members are of the House of Israel, and. So their gathering of Israel is happening right now. It's happening all over the world. And it's fabulous, you know. It's fabulous. And it's it's kind of scary sometimes because it's happening so quickly. 
and I see that and I know I'm not going to be here when when Christ comes you know but he could come in the morning I just pray that I'm ready you know yeah so you were telling me that you have raised um more than a handful of children yes do you want to tell us about your your family sure sure when I was really young, I helped raise my siblings, my mother um, and my father. Um, they they weren't very good parents. And so um, my grandmother who raised me allowed me to travel with them to Oakland, California. So I had my little brother, my three little sisters, and uh, and I helped raise those ones. So those were the the four that I raised right then, and then as I as I grew up and I got married when I was nineteen, had my first baby when I was twenty, and so he was born. My next child was born, so there's two more, and then through our tribe we had a thing called the Hope Ranch. Hope Ranch took care of children that were orphans or foster children. And we took care of 14 foster children plus our two for a whole year. And then we went back to university so that that there was 16 more children right there. And then from there, we go back to Brigham Young University. I'm trying to get a law degree. And I end up being there for nine years and uh, still no law degree, but end up with six more children and but I come home and finally get my degree when I get home here but so here from there we go on and then we have more children of our own we ended up with 17 um, pregnancies um, seven living children we had 10 live births and we lost several of our children one was killed in an accident and um, that was a rough one there. That 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 itself, it really showed me that God doesn't leave you. You might leave him, but he doesn't leave you, you know. So we were um, sh coming from South Dakota and Dickinson, North Dakota. And here um, it was black ice. 11 miles out of town. I could see the city that we were going to. And here this little car was parked alongside the road and it had gone into a ditch because it went off on this interstate and went in the ditch. And it was almost covered with snow. And as we went by there, the lights shone on the back window. And there was two babies looking out that window, probably a two-year-old and a three-year-old. And my little four-year-old, she says, her name was Susan Joe, she said, um, Mom, stop, she said, there's babies in that car. And I said, oh, we can't stop because there's black guys. We were sliding ourselves, you know, so we had to get over there. So we slid about a good mile. We finally stopped and backed up. And it took us about an hour to get that car out. So we got the car out and we went push that car onto the interstate so it'll get out uh, because we were driving a Cherokee chief big heavy duty one we didn't get stuck in about five five three or four up to five foot of snow but we went right through it because it was fresh snow and so here we got everybody out and just as we did that right behind us over the hill comes a semi Mack truck and it's jackknifed it comes over the hill jackknifed and it hits us, knocks us about a good half a mile down the road, gets up on the interstate. We just pull that lady and her two babies and her husband out of the ditch, hits her, kills her, and kills my little girl that night. And um, it was really something. So anyhow, it, we get into the hospital. And the doctor comes, he says, you have three little girls here. He said, uh, I have to take two of them 
to Bismarck, North Dakota, which is a hundred miles. He said, the roads are so bad that uh, we can't fly them. We can't bring the helicopter in, but we're going to have two um, ambulances following each other. Each of your daughters will be in an ambulance. And I says, what about my oldest daughter? She's going to stay here at the hospital because she has a broken nose and her injuries aren't life-threatening like these other two are. I said, okay. I said, so I want to see them before they go, but he wouldn't let me see them. He said, no, I can't let you see them. And I just screamed. I said, I want to see my babies before they go because I didn't know if I was going to see them again, you know, but they wouldn't let me. And then they, then they gave me a shot and they knocked me out. And then the next morning, because this has happened at 8 o'clock at night. So the next morning, about 6 or 7, here somebody comes into my room and it's a nurse. And she says, Mrs. Crawford, she said, because that was my married name, Crawford. She said, Mrs. Crawford, she said, um, I need to talk to you. And I says, well, come over here. I says, but just so you know, I says, I have this feeling in my heart that I lost all my daughters last night. I said, because I haven't seen them. I said, I just so you know that I have that feeling that they all left me last night. I said, then she comes in there and she's crying and she says, you lost season Joe. Season Joe died last night. And, and I just, I couldn't cry. I just couldn't. And I said, I said, come over here. Cause she was just bawling her eyes out. Young girl, probably 30 years old, you know? And so she sits on my bed and I said, before you tell me, I says about anything else. I said, I want to, I want to hold your hand. And so she held my hand and I told her a story of each of my daughters that was with me. And I says, and I'll tell you a story about the youngest one. Season Joe, I said, she went and she's like an angel at Christmas time. She was getting all her presents at Christmas time, I said. And she wouldn't open them. She was enjoying everybody else's presents, but she wouldn't open. She took all of her and put them in a corner in the kitchen, you know. And she just set, she set them all there. She had about 20 presents. And, um. Then after everybody was done opening their presents, she said, come in here and watch me open mine. So everybody was watching her, you know, open her presents and everybody was happy. And she's really a quiet one of all my children. And um, so for her to say, daddy, close that or, or stop the car. Mama, stop the car. You know, there's babies in that. That's that said she speaks up for something that she believes in, you know. So here I told her, I said, so that was in December when we had the Christmas. And so January comes and my husband and I were reading in the scriptures and we're reading about um, Abraham's son. And we were, were talking about the, the prophet, I believe his name is Jacob. And his, they were having a son that he, he was told to sacrifice him. I'm pretty sure that was Jacob turned into Israel. And um, and then he had 12 sons. Well, that one there, um, as he was as he was putting him on the slab to sacrifice him, God put a lamb there so he didn't have to sacrifice him. And God just wanted to test his faith. And so I went and I told I told my my daughter, I said, I said, I don't know how we're going to work this out. I says, but I think God's going to be asking that of us. And I told my husband that. And I said, I just don't know what I said or when I said. So I looked at him and I said, of all of our children that we have, which one would you sacrifice? I said, to prove your love for God. And we looked at each other and we both said, season. Because she was so angelic, you know. And just within three months, she was gone, you know. So after I got done telling, her name is Cindy Mundy. And I got done telling her, you know, about, 
I said, we're an eternal family. I says, we've been sealed in the in the temple of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I says, we're an eternal family. Nothing, even death, even the grave, can't break that apart. I said, we have that forever. I said, and I want you to know, he says, even if I lost all my daughters last night, that we're ready for that because we'll see them again. I said, so don't cry, don't cry. And then, then she really bust out crying. Then she laid on my chest, you know. And then when I held her, that's when I cried. Then she said, Susan Joel left, you know. And I says, I know one of them left because I could feel a part of my my heart missing. And, um, so that's the only time I cried when I was trying to comfort her, you know. Because she didn't understand the eternal aspects of eternal life. And that's so close to our native ways because our native ways believe that this isn't all there is. And it has nothing to do with the church or anything, but we already believe that. We already believed it. But through the power of the priesthood, that priesthood has that sealing power to seal us to each other, you know, so that will be together forever, that the grave won't have a hold on us ever, you know. So I have I have buried ten of my children. And um, it's really a, it's a tough one, you know. And um but I know I'm gonna see them all. And then their dad died about seven years ago. And so I feel jealous sometimes, you know that he's with them right now and I'm still here and things, but I have all my grandchildren and I have, I'm have going to have 51 grandchildren here in about two more weeks. <laughs> I'll have my 51st grandchild. So God's just really, um, really blessed me, you know. He blessed me to live this long, being 71 years old and Every day that he, I open my eyes is a blessing to me. But I know when I leave this frail existence, that's a blessing as well, you know. And I want my children to look at it that way, you know, so. Yeah. Well, even though you're 71, you are a busy woman. And you, <laughs> you, um, you serve you've served your family so much and you continue to do, to do that, but you also serve your community. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? Oh, sure. Yeah, I serve, um, I serve on the tribal executive board for the Port Peck Assiniboine and Sioux Nations of our tribe. And we have um, approximately 14,000 members and they've elected me to serve, um, many times since 1997 and I'm serving right now and we lobby in Washington DC we lobby in um, Helena Montana the capital of Montana we lobby other tribes we go in there and we make sure that they know our needs and we share with them that we just don't want a handout you know we need a hand up you know we need to be able to these these funds that are extra instant, the infrastructure funds that they that they gave out during the COVID times, we hardly get any any of that. Through so the American Rescue Plan, we lobbied for at least three hundred million dollars, and they only gave us a hundred million to last us for. We didn't know how long the epidemic was going to last, but a lot of businesses were closed down, and we had to administer that so that that money that we received is going to be gone by december of 24. so we're still working with that we're helping build um head start buildings we have a wellness center here a 25 million dollar wellness center we um we try to work with homeless shelters that's what we're trying to set up right now is a homeless shelters for our people that a lot of people on the road that they, they sleep in the alleys and things. And we lost a couple last year and we lost a couple this year from being frozen to death because no place else to go. So 
we want to do that. And we want to set up a, a food bank. So we set up one food bank on our reservation. And it really helps the people. <clears throat> so now we're setting up, um, excuse me, it's called day labor so that our people that are on drugs, the people that are on uh, alcohol and any type of things like that, that they could still come out and work. They're still able to work and get money, even if they work two days of the week. Be productive. Don't just sit there, you know, and you, we see them a lot begging, you know, on the street and panhandling. And we want them to feel good about themselves. You know, so if it was up to me, my dream is to buy this building right down the road here. And it's not even for sale yet, but one day it will be, mm -hmm. and that's the building I'm going to buy. Mm -hmm. And I want to set up a, a small little place in there so that the people can have clothes so that when they go in for an interview, they'll have clean clothes. And those are street people we're talking about. Then I want to set up like 30, 30 cots there so that they can stay there through the night. Maybe not through the day, but through the night and be able to have a small kitchen to make um, make them soup and fry bread. And then a place for them to have like a little food bank so that they could have little food during the day. And um, cause there's people there that they forget. They don't realize that those homeless people, half of them are angels sent from God to bring out our compassion, you know, to bring that forward to us and things. So I've been homeless before. I've been homeless with um, uh, 14 of my children and my children's dad went to prison. And so I had 14 of my own children. And then um, part of that, there were six of them that was our, my foster children at that time, which was my niece and nephews. And so I helped raise them all Tell they're about 15 years old, 16. Then the older ones wanted to go back with their mother because I think that they, they were ready by that time. But when I got them, when they were one, two, three years old, their parents weren't in any shape to watch them, you know. So I raised them until they were 15, 16, 17 years old and things. But as, as they go and then they have this thing, I took all my children and I put him in our van and I drove to Bemidji, Minnesota. And um, we didn't have any money. We didn't have anything, but we had enough to get there for gas. And we went to the church and I bore my testimony. I told them, I said, my children's dad, he went to prison and we don't have anything but a van and a few clothes on our back and we had to leave for safekeeping and the church just came out in droves and helped us they got us an apartment to live in at a motel for about a month and um here my little my little youngest boy he was only three at the time he's uh, 33 now but he said he said, Mom, he says, can I pray for the food? I just made some chicken noodle soup. And they call it Mom's Golden Soup. He said, he's going to pray. He's really praying. Close his eyes. His name is Liberty. I said, sure, son, you can pray. So Liberty was praying. He says, Heavenly Father, he says, thank you so much for Mom's Golden Soup. It just tastes so good, he says. But we need bread. We don't have any bread. I said, if you could bring us bread, that would be really wonderful, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen. And I still remember that prayer because within a minute, somebody's knocking at our door. At our door, there's 40 rooms there in that motel, and they're knocking at our door. Here it was a lady from the church, and she gives us this bread. <laughs> And I see her, I just bust out crying because I know it's from the faith of my little child, you know. And he prayed for that. And it was just something that he needed, you know. And it was just powerful. And then within five more minutes after she left, another lady comes. 
She didn't bring apples or oranges. She brought a homemade bread loaf, and it was warm still. And she brought butter with it. And it was like, yes, thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, you know. And so when he gets discouraged, my little, my 33-year-old, when he gets discouraged, I remind him of his faith that he had when he was just a little boy, you know. I said, you pray and God answers you. So about, probably about, a month or two before we left this place, <clears throat> we moved from South Dakota to Minnesota for our own safety. And so here we're there in South Dakota still because we had a ranch over there. And here my children come home from school and they take my youngest son down by the, the trough where the horses drink. It's like a little dam. I call it a little dam. And here they took my baby boy down there. <coughs> and here they went and they said, Mom, and they said, um, I said, where's Liberty at? Well, he's not in the house. I said, no, as soon as you guys came, he ran out the house with you. I said, where did you guys go? He went to the dam and they all started running towards the dam. And I came out of the house and I was running towards the dam and I could see my little boy coming and he was just crying. And he says, mama, they left me there. He says, I was drowning. He was just, oh, it was just something. It was just something. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm getting all choked up. I apologize. But here he, he comes up there and he's just mad at me because he knows I'm always so protective of my children, you know, and he's wondering why I didn't protect him, you know, at the time. You weren't there, how come you didn't help me, mama? He said, I said, well, how did you get out? Because it was six foot down, six feet down, and still only a three-year-old, you know. And he said, mama, he says, I prayed. I prayed, and I asked Heavenly Father to help me. And here, as soon as I prayed, he said, Heavenly Father's arm came down from heaven. And the tree bent over and it pulled me up. Tree, the branch grabbed my one arm and Heavenly Father grabbed my other arm and pulled me out of that dam. This is a little three year old, you know, and he don't even know what it's like to lie, you know, and it was just so beautiful. And I just grabbed him and I just cried and cried. And so things like that, miracles were like that was happening. Um, be because we didn't know all this other stuff was going to happen, this tragedy that was happening two months later, you know. And so um, every one of my children had an experience. And my my five-year-old, he actually saw God. He saw him. And that man that was came in from Utah that was writing that book, he put my son's um his story of his dream of that vision of heavenly father coming into his bedroom and he wrote it all down and he remembered it it happened three nights in a row and i told him i said how come you didn't tell me son he said, i didn't tell me, didn't know if you would believe me mama he said but he told this man and i was sitting there crying as he's telling this man that the heavenly father came into his home and then my other son he saw he was heading into work no he was heading to school because he was a junior in high school he was heading to work in his dream this is an actual dream this time and he says here these angels were floating right by me mom and one was right next to my car and that angel said to me he says he's knocking on the window so he stopped rolled the window down the angel said he said Look up in the sky. So he looked up in the sky and he could see it departing, you know, the clouds parting. And all these angels were coming down. They were just coming down. He says, Christ is returning. And then he said, the 10 lost tribes have returned. The 10 lost tribes have returned. This angel is telling my little 16-year-old, you know. And he said, holy moly, what a beautiful vision or dream i said 
And and so that came repetitive to him too. So all these things were happening to my children. And I got hit by a car during that time, you know, and and God helped me, you know, it was right during this all the same time he helped me because they thought that I had a back injury, but it wasn't. It was just a strained muscle. But it was just, it was awful. But it was the most beautiful time, the time of faith, how we build faith through tragedy, you know. And uh, so I remind my children of that as I grew up and to, and they start having their children, you know. Yeah, it's, it's a good life. It really is. I just, there's so much things that has happened in my life. And if I could write a book, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. God is real. God is real. I saw him when I was six years old. I was um, roller skating across from our home, and we had all dirt roads there, but there was one place that had a sidewalk. <clears throat> and in that sidewalk, I was roller skating, and here I fell so hard that I knocked myself out. And I just must have laid there for several hours, and um. And so here it ended up where I woke up and everything was dark and I looked up and I could see the stars and I didn't know where my home was. I just couldn't figure out where I was supposed to go, you know, so that must have really knocked myself out good. And so I remember being scared. It was nighttime and we're not allowed to be out at nighttime ever, you know. So I remember crying. I says. God help me, God help me. Because we had just read the story of Noah in the ark. We had just read that story. And so <clears throat> Noah was crying out to God and I knew that I could cry out to him. And as soon as I cried out to him, he came from heaven. His face was right there in front of me. And he called me by my name. And he says, we will help you, my daughter, Pat. We will help you. That's all he said. And then so as so I looked at his face, and then I could hear my grandma. I could hear her, and she said, Patsy, where are you? Patsy, where are you? And then that's when I said, Grandma, I'm over here. And here she come running, and she helped me to my feet. And I still had my roller skates on, and she wouldn't let me wear them for a long time. But But God came, and when children have faith like that, they could work wonders. They could run this whole world, if, you know, with all their faith that they have, you know. And so with our beloved prophets of our church, I see the most humblest, you know, but they've gone through everything. They, We think that they haven't had any tragedies, you know, but they've had more tragedies than probably any of us have ever gone through, you know. And they still hang in there and they still stay strong. and. That's what I've learned through the tragedies in my life, you know, because the sun does come out in the morning, and it really does. And I've seen it every time I had to bury a child, you know, in things. And... Before before you got on, I was just browsing through Facebook, and um, I just saw something that, about sunflowers, how um, they... They they face the sun, and if the sun isn't out, then they face each other. And I was just like, I don't know. I just was thinking about that, and I felt like I needed to tell you that some for some reason. Maybe there is somebody who has been your sunflower to to represent the Savior at some point in your life when you've needed somebody. A, a, a earthly angel. Um, the missionaries. Um, I invite the missionaries to eat in my home all the time. <clears throat> and then my eldest son, he went on a mission to England. Um, and uh, while he was there, that's when all this tragedy happened. 
and we had to leave South Dakota. So he came back to help us. And, um, and then his son started growing up and they went on the missions. And so one went to Arizona mission and one went to um, Nashville, Tennessee mission. And so the missionaries that come into our home, they're like angels, you know, they bring everything that I felt when I was 11 years old. They bring that same feeling. So I testified to them how strong that is. And that if you walk into a house to testify about the Book of Mormon, I said, just the spirit itself will get you through that door. And then when you start using your mouth, God will put words in your mouth to say to those people, you know, those ones that need to hear about the Book of Mormon and the strength. And it's a guide to us in these last days, <clears throat> more perfect of any book upon this earth. So when my grandson was in, down in um, Farmington, New Mexico area, um, and he was mostly stayed on the Navajo Indian Reservation and part of the Hopis and the Pueblo Reservation, but mostly Navajo. While he was there, he served with a young man, Elder Davis from Utah. And um, he stayed with him. They had, it was during the COVID time. And so they couldn't hardly go out of their house sometimes. But their service that they did, they, they gave a flower to the native Navajos down there. And so the church had a whole bunch of it delivered to the chapel. So they took it out and gave it to the people. They couldn't go in their homes, but they could leave it on their porch or, you know, someplace. So they did that. They did that with thousands of pounds of flour. So here one day, um, Elder Davis had to leave and he go to Farmington. And my grandson was still on the reservation yet. And here Elder Davis and his companion got killed. On his mission. And he got killed with a young man from Miles City, Montana, a missionary from our area. And I thought about that, you know, I thought about that could have been my grandson, you know. But before he left on his mission, I told him, I said, Grandma's old now. I said, I might not be here when you come back. But if I die while you're there, don't come home. Don't come home. I said, you finish serving the Savior. You finish serving him. So through all of this, I got to um, know his mother. Her name is Sister Kim Davis from Utah. She invited me down there for the funeral and I couldn't go. She invited me down there for the one-year memorial, but I couldn't go. But I'm going to go and meet her one day. And um, just because her boy was with my boy, you know. And um, it was really something. And then my other grandson, um, Elder Brevin Crawford. The other one was Elder Halen Crawford. But Elder Brevin Crawford served in Nashville, Tennessee. So one day on Facebook, I was talking to this one lady and just really having a good time with her. She had a good spirit about her. I didn't know her. I've never met her in my life. But here, and she was talking. I said, where are you from? And she says, I'm from, I'm from, um, I can't remember the city, but I think it's Green something in Kansas. I mean, in um, not Kansas. Down, down in Tennessee. I said, my grandson, I said, he's serving in um, Nashville, Tennessee right now. And I think it's Greenville, Kansas, but I can't remember. I mean, Greenville, um, Alabama. And so, um, oh, oh, Nashville, Tennessee, because that's the mission he was in. <laughs> and so here she, she writes me, she said, you know, she says, um, I don't think we'll ever meet, she said, because he's about two or three hours away from me. 
And I said, okay, well, I'm really lonesome for him. I said, so I'm going to write him and I'm going to tell him that I met somebody from t Tennessee. And she said, okay. And so that was that. Within a week, he got transferred to, to this city where this lady <laughs> lives. Within a week. And it was so beautiful. So I told her, I said, my grandson wrote to me. He's in your city right now. He just got transferred there. And she said, really? She was all excited <laughs> because she wanted to meet a Native American boy, you know. And um, she had her husband and her two, three children, you know. And so here I says, well, I says, well, what they do is they usually eat, if they're not invited out, they usually eat at McDonald's or, you know, a fast food place. And then she says, I'm going to go find them, she said. So she went and she was driving around and here she saw, uh, she went to McDonald's. Here they were in there. It was like, <laughs> what? And then she walked up to this guy and she says, are you Elder Crawford? And he looks at her and he said, yes. He says, I know your grandmother, Pat Arncloud. And he said, what? And they're all excited. And she wants me to give you a hug. <laughs> And so she walks and she hugs my grandson and, of course, makes me cry when she writes to me that night, you know. And then and she lives out in the country of the, from this place. So they asked to go visit her. They were baptized within a month. And um, it was the most miraculous thing of his mission, he said. And he bears testimony of it this very day. He said, that was all through the power of the Holy Ghost. And his mission president used that experience as a as an example for all the different young missionaries. So he'd take my grandson all over with him and he'd have him tell his testimony, you know. And he says, and it happens, he says. It just happens, he said. So his grandmother was in tune with God, he says, with the spirit to help lead to this lady. And this lady was so open with all the articles I put on the, for the church on my, on my Facebook page. And she always liked it, you know. Her name is Jana Tidwell. And um, so that's how that all happened. And so miracles happen every day. I just see it, you know. I love it. I have one final question for you. What does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of Israel? Mm. It's a fulfillment of a promise of our grandfather from Abraham. We are direct descendants of Joseph that was sold into Egypt. And as a direct descendant, everything that he has gone through the native people, the Lamanite people have gone through. And one of the things that I, I learned by going and, and being in Brigham Young University for, for nine years was that we found out that the Nephites and the Lamanites, they were like the Cinnaboyans and Sioux. They fell in love with each other. They were warring tribes, but they fell in love with each other and started marrying each other. And before you know it, you couldn't even tell who was Lamanite and who was Nephite. You can never tell and things. So um, being a, of the house of Israel and knowing who I am, you know, I take after my grandfather, Joseph, that was sold into Egypt. And he showed us how to do it. When there's disparity around, you make the best of everything. And being a member of this church, and the gathering of Israel, that's what I'm all about. You gather Israel by showing your great example to the world, you know, to show that you're not ashamed of Jesus Christ. In our language, we have a word for our Heavenly Father, and that's Wakantanka. He's, the, he's the, the big one. He's the highest supreme one. And his son is Jesus Christ. And his name is Wanikia. And so there's two different words. So we know in our language, there's 
not only those ones, but other people that are gods too as well. But those are the ones that serve us on Mother Earth. Those are the only ones that we're concerned with that touch our lives. So being of the house of Israel is a blessing. I tell my children, you always be happy for that. Don't wear pride. Throw pride away. Be humble. Be humble like Father Joseph. Because that's the one that set us the example. I said, when people spit on us, look down on us, think that we're all drunks. I said, we are of the highest house in Israel. I said, so you got to remember who you are. So you see people coming in from the streets, coming into our church, just wearing rags. Those are princesses and princes. Those are kings and queens. And those are in the eternal worlds. You know, that's how God looks at us. You know, we don't have anything, you know, to harm people with except our words. Because if we hurt people and things, those are the things that Heavenly Father, we have to ask him to for, forgive us. And some of them feel that they come into the chapel, they don't feel that they can ever be forgiven. And I shared with them, as soon as you think that, I said, God forgives you because he forgives us of everything. But we have to ask his forgiveness. We have to be humble. And I said, Joseph, that was sold into Israel, I said, he was the humblest. He was in prison. He was an actual prison. But he stayed humble. And that his humbleness took him out of that prison. And he became an overseer of all of Israel, of the Israelites. And he was in Egypt. And so the Israelites, they came up to him and asked him for food, even though he was an Israelite himself. So that was really something. I really appreciate you, you know, doing this interview. I don't get a chance to speak to too many people on this subject except at church, you know. But I'm not ashamed to share the gospel because every place I go, when I gave the Book of Mormon to President Clinton, God helped me that day. He helped me push me forward so he was able to receive my testimony written in the Book of Mormon. And so when you rub shoulders with people, you got to remember they're angels, you know, sent from God, you know. And some angels will stay and some angels will leave. You know. There's angels all around us. And, and I saw them when I had my cancer in my body. Two of them came to my home. And they fought the adversary for me. And help save my life, you know, so. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I can just see it in, in the way you're, you just glow. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. God bless you. Don't be a stranger. So recently I was... Um, having my children do a program with me and we had to write a statement for our family and so we did that together and I wanted to read it to you. We the people of the Hales family household in order to form a more perfect family and to establish a common defense against Satan vow to be good and learn stuff so we can return to Heavenly Father as a united family. I know that be good and learn stuff doesn't sound as formal as the rest of the the state the statement but for our family it actually is meaningful because it's a short prompt for us to remember what we should be doing of course all the gospel things but this is a short statement my husband almost every single day that he drops the children off at school says that to them as they get out of the school out of the van. Uh, be good and learn stuff. And we have just decided that it's so important for our children to be good and to um, to have their minds open. And both of those 
re- both of those values apply temporally and spiritually, and I love that. So I just thought you should hear our statement because I loved it. And I hope you're having a super wonderful, awesome day. Tribe of Testimonies is not sponsored by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The music is a traditional hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, arranged and performed by Kyle Forsyth. I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear how this podcast is affecting you. And I'm always looking for guests. If you or someone you know would be a great guest, you can reach me at tribeoftestimonies at gmail.com.